The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Meng Meng Gu in the uh, Department of Horticulture at Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Along with me today, we have um, Paul Winsky, a hort agent from Tarrant County, uh, Dr. Becky Grubbs from uh, Texas Water Institute, Dr. Yvette Zhang from Ag Econ, Air Fang from Overton, and then myself. And we will have Laura Miller, the hort agent in Tarrant County, um, Dr. Kevin Nong joining us uh, later on. Um, so today we have, mainly we have uh, three topics. Um, uh, Paul is gonna talk about the uh, some beneficial re release and beneficial insects. Um, Laura is gonna talk about plant of the week, lacy oak, and Dr. Yvette Zhang is gonna talk about uh, some of the really interesting uh, consumer surveys under, you know, in terms of uh, gardening activities uh, under COVID situation. And if we have time, I have two uh, situations uh, related to uh, the cream myrtle problems that I wanna share with you and hopefully we can uh, figure out what the problems are. I'm gonna make Paul the uh, speaker. Okay, thank you, Meng Meng. And let me make that full screen. Okay, are we good? Yes, we're good. Okay, great. Uh, okay, I mean, so we're seeing, hey, Paul, we're seeing the like presenters' notes. So okay, I don't know if you can swap displays there at the very top left. It says display settings. I think you can swap it there. Top left. Oh, display. Here we go. Thank you. Swap presenter view and slash. Yeah, that's the one that should do there it. There we go. There okay. Go. So we're good now? Great. Thanks, Erfan. Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about effectively releasing beneficial insects into your greenhouse or nursery operation. Um, you've probably been hearing a lot about beneficial insects, how they are part of an IPM program, and as a grower or landscaper or uh, even um, interior plantscaper, you might be wondering, how do I get these beneficial insects into the plants or into the crop successfully. So uh, just a brief overview, IPM, what we wanna do is produce a quality crop. Um, we wanna reduce the pest population, or we wanna also, and we also wanna uh, lessen or reduce the economic impact that it could have uh, on the overall plant quality. And how do we do that? What tools do we have? We have these uh, beneficial insects or mites that we can release in the crop. Um, there are, of course, the chemical products. Um, you have to monitor and you have to be motivated in order to make this program work. Uh, in a previous life, I worked for one of the companies and did technical support. Um, the first thing out of most growers is, is this the silver bullet? Um, can I get rid of my chemicals? And the answer is no, um, but you can work um, use the beneficials in conjunction with the chemicals if needed. Um, uh, and the one thing we also saw was by monitoring and being motivated, a lot of these growers became um, much better growers because they were spending more time in the crop. Um, quickly, why are growers changing? Um, sometimes they run into resistance problems. Uh, you know, they're not listening to Arafon and um, rotating their active ingredients. Uh, which is a problem. Um, worker exposure. Uh, the large growers or any of the growers, if uh, uh, the re-entry intervals can be an issue when you need to go in there to pull uh, cro uh, crops or product in order to get it off to market. Uh, the efficacy of the programs overall in IPM have improved dramatically. Uh, and this is due to you know the products that are out on the market, but also those growers um, making the commitment to to have it work. Um, using putting out put, uh, releasing beneficials is really quite easy. Uh, you don't need a pesticide applicator license to do it. Um, you know, working with mites, you probably want a dust mask, uh, depending if you're putting out bulk product. Um, but overall, a lot of these products um, are quite easy to put out, uh, and it, it's very easy to uh, train your personnel to do it. Um, on the sustainability side, there's market pressure to reduce pesticide use. Um, growers uh, and the public want lower residues in crops. 
Um, there have been studies, especially over in Holland, with regard to crop, crop quality. Um, those that have been grown using IPM and using leaning on beneficials, uh, you can see a marked difference in the overall quality of the crop uh, by, by using this approach. So there are a lot of positives uh, in order to make this uh, a plus and, and, and make it happen for you. Um, when you receive your product, you want to make sure the species, you know, it's pure, it has no contaminants, it's alive. Uh, we always would recommend, you know, pulling a sample to make sure you could see the mites walking around or uh, if they were flyers, were they hatching and uh, were they ready to, you know, whether they're going to lay their eggs or sting or feed. Um, so working with these companies, um, they do an excellent job in getting the product to you uh, in a viable stage. Um, you want to get the crop, uh, you want to get the product into the crop efficiently and in optimum numbers, of course. Uh, and then depending on the size of the grower, um, you know, you're always looking for efficiency. So um, you want to look for labor savings. And a lot of these companies have come up with interesting ways in order to help you um, do it efficiently and get the beneficials uh, into the crop. So product delivery uh, is pretty much all the main players, uh, whether it's BioLine or Copert or BioBest, um, you know, they have shaker tubes, they have um, uh, bottles with vented caps, um, bulk bags. So uh, the products, um, the bulk products, it, pretty much the same across the board. Uh, now, everybody has their own way of producing them and, and different things like that. Um, but, you know, whether it's a shaker tube, you know, they're all going to have uh, similar type delivery systems. And these all work depending on the size of the, the grower you are. Um, from a smaller grower, you're going to probably want something, you know, you, you're not going to need as much as opposed to, say, a large grower. Uh, and you're going to look for that efficiency in getting that product, uh, that beneficial into the crop. So bulk delivery, uh, you can see here. Um, probably a liter bottle, uh, the cap twist, and you can shake it right on to the, the leaf. This is a, a, a cucumber crop. Um, here where they have a distribution box, um, they can put some in that uh, and then move on, place these boxes throughout the crop. The mites naturally like to grow up, so it allows them to uh, go and establish in the crop. Uh, this is an established crop, so you've got the natural bridges from the foliage for the mites uh, to get out and uh, work their way to find the, uh, the prey that they are looking for. So <clears throat> one of the companies, uh, we talk about the sachet breeding systems, and they are, in fact, uh, breeding systems. So you can see on the right here, um, think of a, a tea bag, okay, a breathable tea bag, and this is a breeding system. So uh, it might be bran, uh, it might be, it, it depends. Everybody's got a different product. And inside this um, sachet, there's a hole up top. Um, there's the, the predatory mite that will release over time. And then uh, there is even a, 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 a mite, another mite inside there that's a food source for it. Um, so these uh, sachets may be loaded with, say, 500 um, predatory mites. But over time, and a lot of times we see this with the amblyseus mites, um, they'll release for up to six to eight weeks. So we can get high numbers of predatory mites in the crop. It improves protection, and it's less, um, less often that you have to handle it. So there's less um, time. Um, from the workers in order to get these uh, predatory mites in the crop. Now, these systems worked very well uh, if you were doing hydroponics or you had drip irrigation. Um, if you had overhead irrigation, uh, these would get wet, mold would start, uh, and the release rate would be affected. So um, in the next slide here, we're going to see on the right, uh, this company, Bioline, came up with a product called uh, the Gemini. Um, uh, sachet. And so with the Gemini, um, it's an A-frame type. It's waterproof paper. You can hang it um, on a branch. You can hang it uh, over a wire. Uh, and the water would run down, but the predatory mites uh, would release uh, through it without any issues. Um, and then what we see in these other images are mini sachets. 
Uh, and these, again, um, maybe the, the number of predatory mites that are in there are lower, uh, uh, lower numbers, but the process is the same. Uh, you can hang them in the crop, they're hung every so many feet. Uh, you can see here with the hanging basket, it works very nicely but prior to that basket going up overhead. Um, you get that six to eight week uh, coverage. You've got, um, uh, they are in place and a lot of times it, it covers the uh, length of the crop uh, while it's in production. Um, the one thing to, to, to be aware of is when you're using these on the, uh, especially hanging baskets, you know, that environment, that climate's gonna be a little bit different up top as opposed to down at bench level. So depending on what you need to control uh, may affect the type of mite uh, that you're gonna wanna use uh, in this sachet. And then there was another iteration. So then they started, uh, now they, you can get them on stakes already. So um, you can see them here in this, is, in this poinsettia crop. Um, they've got a plastic stake. Again, the, the process or, or the concept is same. There's a hole in the back side of it. There's a piece of um, waterproof paper that covers that hole. So it, um, it, it, it won't um, have issues with it getting wet. Um, you can see BioBest, they've got these um, wooden sticks. And just to point out, you know, in propagation is probably one of the best spots where you can start to do, um, release some of your beneficials. Um, the plants are nice and close. You can get a lot of coverage and a small amount of space. And so prior to them going to uh, potting um, into larger pots, you can have your first line of defense already uh, established in that crop. So it works out um, very nicely and it makes it um, easier and more efficient for the grower. Now this, uh, what BioLine also then did is they developed what they called bug line, okay? So they took a strip of um, the Gemini's and depending on the, the type of mite, it's either every other uh, sachet or every third one, depending, um, they are filled and it's pulled out over top of the crop. Uh, so you can see improved emergence, better distribution, labor savings, one of the biggest problems for a grower. Um, you know, uh, that's their biggest cost. So this 75% saving versus having uh, a team go out and hang sachets uh, is a big win uh, for the grower. And uh, this grower, uh, th now this is for a, uh, a mum crop, cut mums. So he attached these hooks. Um, this is how they would come in a box. Uh, and then he just attached it to his uh, overhead uh, irrigation system and then ran at the length of the house. And then he only needed two people to put these out, one to hook up on the one end uh, and the other person to unhook at the far end of the greenhouse. So uh, improved efficiencies. And then he had release for six to eight weeks. So these, the sachet system works extremely well, whether you're a large grower, indoor, outdoor, um, and they work, they're specifically designed uh, for use with the predatory mites. Now, Copert, uh, one of the other companies, they've got some mechanical systems uh, that are in place. So we'll start off with the smallest one. Uh, this is the mini air bug. Uh, so how this process works is uh, this is hooked into a battery pack that the uh, applicator would wear around his waist. Uh, and we've got a slight, uh, a fan that would blow it off at a, a, uh, a very fine stream. We're not talking the leaf blower type uh, velocity here. Uh, and the uh, predator predominantly predatory mites would be loaded in this canister and this would rotate. As it rotates, you can see the holes. So um, the mites with the carrier would fall in front of the fan and would be blown over the uh, area where the uh, crop is being grown. So this is the mini air bug. Here's the air bug. It's a little bit larger system. And you can see here, they're doing trials to see what the coverage is. So they've got some Petri dishes down along with some sticky cards in order to get an idea, are they getting the coverage um, that they need um, with this type of system. Uh, the next one up, of course, it just gets larger. Here's the aero bug. So this runs off of a monorail. This whole system can be picked up and, and you know, pulled off and moved um, over to where the next monorail would be. But the concept is the same. Um, you can see the fans um, that would blow. 
Uh, you would load your mites in, in these canisters. They would rotate as it would travel across the, uh, the length of the greenhouse. Uh, these mites would, would be um, released and, and placed into the crop. Um, for some field crops, uh, they have what they call the rotabug. Uh, so this is uh, on a wheel. Uh, the grower pushes it down over top. So like if this was uh, strawberries, um, these white wheels are all loaded with the predatory mites. Um, and then as you're walking, they rotate and they release uh, every so many feet. So again, making it easier, making it more efficient uh, for the growers to get those uh, beneficials into the crop. Um, for white fly control, um, Irfan last week talked about uh, Incarsi, uh, the different white fly. So Incarsi is, is specific for um, the greenhouse white fly, uh, trial uroides. Um, and so these uh, mummies or, or the pupa are attached to uh, an adhesive. As they mature, uh, they release out, they will fly and, and then start to parasitize um, the white fly. Um, one of the issues for Aromoceros, which is one of the other um, white fly uh, parasitic wasp, is they only uh, emerge from one end of that uh, cocoon, um, where Encarsia can emerge from both. So they have these blister packs, and it's sort of a bran buckwheat type carrier, um, and they found that they had much better emergence um, you hang them in the crop. You don't want a, them sitting in full sun because this little micro environment could definitely heat up, but you would open up the back, um, either hang it or place it in crop. You could see it here in a, uh, uh, poinsettia crop. And, um, over time, these guys would release and establish in that crop and they will go after both, uh, the greenhouse and sweet potato white fly. So, so, uh, both forms of white fly. And now from what I've, uh, been reading, um, the companies are actually even mixing them both. You, you can buy a mix of Encarsia and Aromoceros together if you're not sure which white fly you have. Um, so they're making it easier for you to get them uh, under control. Uh, this blister pack is also used uh, with bi byline with Aphidiolides. Um, this is a gall midge and uh, the female lays her eggs usually near the aphids and it's the larval stages that feed. Uh, and so what they found, you can see the carrier is different with this. This is in vermiculite, but the concept is the same. Open up the back door, um, allow it to, um, the, the mature ones to fly out and establish, uh, and you are uh, good to go. Very good protect, protection, um, approved efficiency, and you know you're getting your beneficials into that crop. Um, the next iteration, which was really pretty interesting, and I, uh, I would, uh, you know, definitely uh, recommend you, ch you check out this uh, website, Powerbug Solutions. Um, this is a company out of uh, Salinas, California. I believe they started in uh, Australia. Um, but now they're taking it to a whole nother level. Um, so we're talking about large growers. We're talking about uh, vineyards, uh, orchard production, things like that. And, but the concept is the same. Uh, these canisters are loaded with the uh, beneficial, could be mites, could be larvae of uh, green lacewing. Um, they also put up the uh, mealybug destroyer, cryptolemus. Um, and as this flies, these will rotate. You could see the holes in, in through here. And um, they, they, the company comes out, they're not in Texas yet, um, but they're in about, I would say, at least a half dozen states uh, in the US. Um, but again, for the larger growers um, looking to use beneficials in their production, um, this is the next step. Um, so it's really quite interesting to see how um, the, re the release of these beneficials, uh, how it has changed over time. Uh, and just to end up, you know, there's always uh, both companies or all the companies actually, BioBest, Copert, and BioLine, they have the compatibility charts. Um, so if you've got active ingredients, if you have the chemicals and you're releasing beneficials, um, it's pretty straightforward. If you have questions and you're in the Houston area, give me a holler or, you know, I'm sure Irfan would be more than happy to help you guys get started also. 
Um, but um, this information is, is very helpful in helping you make those decisions. Um, if you have to spray, um, what can you use so you don't knock out your entire population of beneficials? Uh, if you get liners in from someplace and you you ask uh, what they have been treated with, and you get something that's been, you know, treated here like with acephate that has a, a long residual, um, up to eight weeks, and you want to release cucumeris, well, you know, hold off on releasing because you're just going to be wasting time and money because they won't establish because of that residual issue. So. Um, Hopefully this has helped you out. Here are some additional resources. Um, BioBest, Copert, and BioLine are probably the big three. Uh, these other ones have come along. Um, Beneficial Insectary, Arbico Organics, Organics and BioBee. Uh, and then if you want a, a, another outside source, Bug Lady Consultant, um, Suzanne Wainwright Evans, a lot of good information on there, we, regardless of if you're a grower, uh, if you're a gardener, backyard gardener, um, she's written a lot, she's got very good information on there, and she's always more than willing to talk about beneficial insects um, if you are interested. So, uh, if that is it, um, Mung Mung, I will pass it back over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Laura? Yes, Mung Mung. <laughs> you ready? I am. So I wanted to show you all, uh, we have a brand new Texas Superstars brochure. And uh, when I finish talking about that cool lacy oak, I'll post the contact information so that you could request these. If you wanted to give them to your customers, uh, Texas Department of Agriculture prints them out. It's a really nice, beautiful, colorful brochure. And if you're a retail garden center or a landscaper and you'd like to be able to provide this to, to the people that you sell to, um, you can certainly request them from Texas Department of Agriculture. Laura, so, can, can you show it to the, uh, the camera? Just, yeah, make the phone. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, so I was trying to do that, but but I'll definitely post the contact info too. Um, plant of the week, the lacy oak. If you look in the superstar brochure, there are not a lot of trees, and there's a really good reason for this. It's it's time consuming to trial trees. You think about it, uh, you want to see a tree for several years before you decide if it's a good thing to recommend that people plant that tree. So as um, Annuals, you know, it takes about a year or two. You can figure out if you like it or not. Perennials, kind of a few years and you'll know, but trees are really a long-term landscape investment. They're a long-term uh, crop for a grower and it's just a little bit harder to trial them. But this is a super cool tree. Uh, most people in Texas, if you ask them for their favorite tree, and ISAT did this recently, they set up like a bracket system in March and had, you know, people pick the winning tree and then get all the way to the final end, people will choose the live oak. Uh, most of our famous trees, our historic trees are live oaks, the century tree at A&M, the trader's oak here in Fort Worth, all of the trees that people, you know, think about when they think tree are often live oaks. The problem with live oaks, though, is that they're really, really big. So you need a large landscape to be able to grow a live oak. You need some space for that thing to, to spread out, sometimes even 100 feet wide. Uh, a lacy oak is a much smaller tree. Uh, the lacy oak is a Texas native that is pretty much only found in Texas. There may be a little bit in Mexico, but it is an Edwards Plateau tree. So a hill country tree that grows on thin, soils uh, over limestone so it, it can handle high ph it can handle limited soil volumes making it a great tree for an urban area it's um not evergreen like a live oak but it is really attractive pretty much all year and one of the nicest features it has is that new growth is really a beautiful kind of pink um yellow attractive new growth you can see down there um, with my hand there. Um, the other great thing about the lacy oak is the color of the mature leaves. And 
on the left side, that's at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. Um, just this week, I took that picture. And you can see that pretty blue green color. It's almost like the the um, um, uh, Deslirion in the picture. It's that kind of blue green is one of its best features. Now this is currently, I believe, only propagated from acorns. So there's no selections. There's not a special blue one. Uh, that little tree that you see on the right hand side is my little lacy oak and it's more of a green green color, but it's still very pretty and that new growth is really nice. This tree is hardy to zone seven. It should be grown in full sun and you shouldn't overwater it. Um, the full grown size of the lacy oak, if we can go back to that, is uh, usually you see one about 30 by 30 in the landscape but the the national champion is in comal county and i did want to point out that the national champion is actually 59 feet tall and 71 feet wide so it can conceivably get to a much larger size but most of them are are like what you see there at the botanic garden that one's been in the ground for i believe 25 years and it's about 30 by 30 and it looks really nice um this is a great tree for a low water use landscape. In fact, the way you could kill it would be by watering it too much. Um, Houston might just naturally water it too much. I don't know, Paul, if, if you have had any success with this tree in Houston. But um, here in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, it's great. And to all points west, it's a wonderful tree. You can see there at the Botanic Garden, they've got a real nice low water use landscape around this tree and they're all doing well together and growing great. So that's that's the lacy oak, um, propagated by acorns, um, Texas native, nice for a smaller landscape for the average home lot. It's a great choice. Beautiful blue green color, attractive new growth. And um, just, I have nothing bad to say about it. That little tree I planted in uh, November, 2017. It was a giveaway at Texas Arbor Day, and I planted it uh, there. And you can see that you can't don't really have a, a cute little kid next to it to see how tall it is, but that tree is actually taller than Air Fawn. So um, it's grown really well through these past past few years, three years. Well, thank you, Laura, and I especially. Uh appreciate you saying that you know the only way that you could uh, uh, kill the tree is by watering it too much and that kind of goes true with a lot of west texas hill country uh, plants like texas mountain laurel you know and and you know one of the way is uh, by watering it too much right that's true absolutely true Yvette, do you want to share our uh, share your screen to show your uh, uh, presentation? Yes. Did you? Yes. Can you see my yes. PowerPoint now? Yep. Okay. Just one two. So you see my PowerPoint now, right? Yes. Go ahead. I this is Yvette Chang from Agriculture Economics. I'm going to talk about adaptation to new business strategies under COVID-19. So this is a poster during World War I, sow the seed of victory, encouraged Americans to grow victory gardens. One century later, home gardeners in the U.S. are returning to that idea to fight against a global pandemic. During a time of social distancing and self-quarantine, Fortunately, gardening is one of those hobbies that don't need to be put on hold. So even as many people's daily lives have been disrupted by the COVID-19 and business across America shattered amid the pandemic concerns, the green industry may still hold strong. There are three things I want to talk about today, adapt and adjust to new customer behavior and conserve your cash and stay informed about government assistance programs. Many nurseries and gardeners, uh, garden stores have seen a jump in sales during COVID-19. The figure on the left shows the top five main categories on Amazon that have seen their largest growth this year. 
So the red one, rapid, the red one, um, the largest growth is from video games, and the yellow, the yellow line is the second largest growth from patio, lawn, and gardens. So we see here, once spring came around, even a pandemic cannot take away the joy of gardening. And when I typed nursery sale during COVID-19 on Google search, so we see uh, here on, on the right, right? So we, I saw all those positive news about increase in nursery sales compared to the same season last year. Recently, Los Angeles Times published a very interesting news article about change in consumer shopping trend and how nurseries adapt to new customer behavior during COVID-19 outbreak. So I'm listing here some of the, their main findings. For many nurseries last year this time, majority of customers came in on weekends. But now they are getting lots of orders throughout the week, not just on weekends. Many small nurseries had to close to on-site visits during COVID-19 outbreak, but they offer sales online by phone or by phone. And many of them list inventory online or set up online order forms. Some nurseries permit limited customers to come in by reservation and they still place social distancing signs to remind people to keep uh, six feet apart. And many stores require everyone to wear masks. Some even provide disposable masks for customers um, coming without uh, masks. Large nurseries, can you, can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Is it not advancing? Uh, Yvette, we can hear you. Yvette, yes, we can hear you. Okay, we may, Yvette, can you hear us? So I think somehow I lost connection. Oh, now you're back. Okay. Yeah. So which slide was, was I? The consumer shopping trend. Okay, consumer uh, shopping trend. Okay, here. Just somehow I lost uh, connections. So some, so large nurseries are more likely to keep their doors open. Uh, um, Yvette, but, Yvette, can you show the slide? What I, right now I see the sow the seeds of victory. Okay. Yes, now you're good. Thank you. Consumer shopping trend, right? Yes. Okay. So, so some stores, some stores permit limited customers to come in by reservation and they place social distancing signs, require everyone to wear masks and provide disposal masks for customers without, um, without them. And large nurseries are more likely to keep their door open and they still uh, implement social distancing rules. And many of them offer remote ordering and curbside pickup. The strongest sales are in vegetable, fruits, berries, basically anything edible. There's a huge interest uh, in organic gardening. Organic soy sales have skyrocketed. And many nurseries and garden stores reported a surge in first time gardeners. It can be a challenge for, um, for stores to answer questions from them. So many stores now add Q&A blogs to websites and provide information um, on Facebook, YouTube, some even provide uh, online classes. Um, and some stores ask customers to email their question. Some nurseries find that inventories are being depleted too quickly to meet the demand. So for, for the nurseries, uh, with many of their plants come from seeds, they started ordering, uh, they started ordering seeds early for full gardening. 
For our research team, we have surveyed over 1,500 consumers nationwide in April and May this year. 45% of our survey participants were spending more time gardening during the COVID-19 outbreak compared to the same season last year. And we found a change in consumer expenses. So the orange bar, uh, the, the, the blue bar is decrease in expenses and the gray bar is increase in purchasing. So we see here, um, we see increase in purchasing for vegetables and fruits, but decrease in purchasing in landscape plants, especially landscape trees uh, during COVID-19 compared to the same season last year. And these figures show the change in consumer expenses on gardening products during COVID-19 compared to, compared to uh, the, the same season last year. So we see increase in seeds and small plants, but decrease in purchasing for soil and compost. Um, Oh, also increase in soil and compost and um, accessories. We also found significant change in many purchasing outlets under COVID-19. So in-store purchase decreased significantly. So the blue bar is before, um, before outbreak. And the orange bar is the consumer's choice of purchasing outlet after a during break. So, the online per orders increased significantly, especially online order with mail delivery. However, um, from our, however, from our um, market analysis, we actually found only forty. Uh, there are 45, 40, around forty percent of nurseries do not have websites, and only twelve percent of uh, nurseries actually offer online shopping options. Many experts are, are predicting that COVID-19 is a health and economic crisis that has a sustainable impact on consumer attitudes, behaviors, and purchasing habits. And some behavior change will be long-term and last beyond COVID-19. So it's important to know your marketplace consumer need and adopt a proactive approach to understand uh, what changes will occur and keep up with supply and demand and be ready to adjust your products, services, and strat uh, strategies quickly to meet uh, consumers' needs. The second thing I want to talk about is cash is king. So I recommend a very good reading published by J.P. Morgan Chase Institute in 2015. So they have, they used the data from more than 600,000 small businesses. From their analysis, they found half of them only have large enough cash to allow them to stay in business for 27 days if they stop bringing money. And for labor intensive industries, these, uh, they even have less of this buffer. So, during the moments of economic crisis, it's very important to monitor and conserve your cash to maintain liquidity, um, flexibility, and security. Now I want to um, point out there are many government assistance programs available for agricultural businesses. And, I'm, uh, and here I'm also list some basic information to help you identify the programs you are eligible to. So USDA website, United States Department, Department of Agriculture provides very useful programs and resources for agriculture. For example, specialty crop program for fruits, vegetables, tree nuts, dried fruits, horticulture, nursery crops, including floriculture. It, Beginning farmers and ranchers, uh, ranchers loans for farmers and ranchers who are in their first 10 years of operation are beginning farmers. New farmers are for those who are considering a career in farming or just getting started. So there's a difference between new farmers and beginning farmers. And there are also resources for minority and women farmers and, and ranchers, and also programs for veterans. 
for organic farming, there's a national organic program. And there also, there's also an organic certification cost share program. And there are also programs for small and mid-sized farmers. So you can find uh, the USDA service agency using the USDA service centers locator. And Small Business Administration, SBA, now they are also making their, their resources available for agricultural um, producers. This is something relatively new this year. For the past 30 years, SBA has been prohibited by law to provide disaster assistance to, um, to agriculture producers. But just this year, they start making some of their programs available to agriculture producers. So you can find, you can find out if you are qualified um, to their programs using their small size standards um, guides, uh, uh, tables, or um, you can find local assistance from their website, sba.gov local assistance. And there are many programs for COVID-19 specifically. So you can check USDA farmer resources in beginning May 27, uh, May 20, uh, 26, USDA through the Farm Service Agency are accepting applications from agriculture producers who have suffered losses. Um, Program details can be found at farmers.gov. And SBA, Small Business Administration, is making economic injury disaster loans and other programs available to US agriculture business. And also um, FSA. FSA and, and Nature Resource and Nature Resource Conservation Service are continuing, uh, continuing to receive and process applications, including agriculture resource, uh, agriculture risk coverage and price loss coverage programs, and other disaster assistance programs. And of course, Texas Nursery and Landscape Association website is also a very useful um, resource. So um, I suggest people to stay informed about all these government assistance programs and apply for the programs that you are eligible to um, if needed. And for our own research team, we will be conducting more consumer surveys this year. So your input and suggestions are very welcome. Thank you very much. So that's pretty much what I want to cover today. Well, thank you. Uh, you're gonna stay around in case we have some questions, right? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, let's have some fun with the crate myrtles. Uh, all the uh, panelists, would you guys? Uh, oh, I need to show my uh, webcam too. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you remember? Do you guys remember during one of our first episodes that we've seen uh, some uh, crate myrtles uh, look just like this, right? Becky, you said you're going to hang around. You're still there, right? Not just Laura. And as you can see that, uh, that the, uh, you know, the, the growth, you know, this, this time of the year, this time of the year that the crepe myrtles are actually flowering, you know, in my neighborhood, the Sarah's favorite wide, uh, Muskogee, uh, Tuscarora, they're, they're all flowering. And look at this uh, little uh, pitiful uh, guy uh, or girl. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, they're two in one. They're two in one. Uh, so yeah, just it's you know very stunted uh, growth and and just you know definitely not having its uh, best days. And this uh, close log. So uh, when I just got these two pictures, I was like, okay, uh, can you tell me more? Uh, you know, so I sent an email, and then this is the uh, this is the answer that I got. Uh, you know, I said I asked questions. How many trees out of how many are showing this? Uh, they have about 40 trees around the property. That looks like six of these are showing these uh, these symptoms. Um, one of which has been there for 20 years. So uh, okay, so that's good information. Uh, any other plants in the area showing similar symptoms? Okay, a vine that grows in the back uh, looks like it may might have these uh, same symptoms. 
what's the environment? Uh, I was so I was hoping I was hoping that'll lead to something like herbicide because you know like pre-emergent herbicide that kind of thing. So because remember in our first one that we in our one of our first episodes that you know that turns out was a pre-emergent herbicide that that was uh, applied uh, during the uh, the winter time. So I was really you know uh, trying to get you know whether there's uh, there's herbicide issue, you know, cotton fields, sometimes they do the application. Well, they are in the country, but with no agricultural, uh, agriculture farmlands. Um, so I said, any chemicals, like especially herbicides applied in the area? No, they haven't, uh, they haven't uh, applied anything. And my last question, and they stopped use weed and feed a few years ago because, you know, the, the person was worried about all the trees. And the last one was, you know, it just uh, hopefully it's a catch all question, like anything else you can tell me. Um, so they came back, the trees affected are along the main road. So that's one. Uh, so that's one commonality about these trees. I don't know if the county has sprayed anything along the road. So those are the so. So the panelists, what do you guys think? Do we have a phone number for the county? <laughs> <laughs> I will make sure that like that that's going to be in the future. You know, in the additional questions. <laughs> Looks like two more damage. damage. Yeah. What it's, about uh, pattern of damage on the tree? Is it the side that facing the road worse? Uh, as you can see, here's the fence. Uh, here, I, I think that's the fence of, you know, I would assume that, uh, you know, this is uh, so the person is standing on the roadside, you know, taking a picture of the tree with, uh, you know, with their fence at the back. So that would be my guess. Uh, so, so I think we uh, also we have an input from the uh, from the audience. So possible herbicide, maybe the county sprayed something uh, to the roadside and then just got drifted to the uh, to the crepe myrtle to the crepe myrtle plant. Looks like maybe what? the what the other thing is you what? have to ask when did they if they did any road work uh, not too long after the symptoms appeared because realize when they use heat tar stuff uh, if it's that close to the roadway it can affect the root system which is going to result in nutritional like symptom because one of the reasons this sort of symptoms can occur is because of a zinc type deficiency zinc type deficiency <clears throat> some other micronutrient maybe i don't know on crate myrtle what that would be there, there what about some... broad mites? Mites are also broad mites, because I seen that in uh, uh, when we used to have our stock beds uh, for sweet gum. Uh, if we got broad mite damage, it would look just like this. Absolutely, that's another one. You know those those aerophyte type mites. Mm -hmm. To rule out uh, 2,4-D, I mean, we had uh, a bunch of 2,4-D drift on our 200 crit myrtles we're using for a crit myrtle bar scale trial. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and you know, basically we got like, almost looked like the leaves are burning and kind of fell off. So I don't know that we saw this particular symptomology from 2,4-D. That's not to say that maybe it's a different herbicide, uh, but trying to rule out maybe what it, what it's not. Hmm. Uh, in terms of micronutrients deficiency, uh, very common uh, for the um, very common for cray myrtles in either containers or landscapes are what we call a rabbit ear. You know what we call a rabbit ear oh, uh, symptom, but you know that the still you know the leaves are fully developed, and then you have these intervenal. Um, not chlorosis, but intervenal kind of necrosis, you know, and that I don't know why it's called a rabbit ear, but, it's, but that's mama, but, it's called rabbit tracks, not oh, rabbit yeah. ear. That's that's why because it looks like thank little thank hole. you, rabbit, rabbit tracks. It yes, it looks like ear. Yeah, so thank you, rabbit tracks. So, uh, but and, yeah, and I always thought rabbit tracks was like a physiological problem, like the 
growth rate was just too fast or, yeah. you know, you would see it sometimes in the spring. Right. So I, I, don't know. I haven't seen any micronutrients deficiency, you know, in any symptoms uh -huh. like this. Okay, well, uh, I'm good. I'm, I'm, uh, I guess we're good on this that, again, further information is needed to get a, a, a more precise diagnosis, maybe broader mites or other, you know, road work that's being done to this, uh, to this prey myrtle. Uh, you guys ready for the next challenge? Make it easier. Make it easier. Oh. Oh, God. Is it this? Because it looks very similar. No. no, 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 no. Okay, this one is hard. <laughs> this one is really hard. So, uh, so I got the picture. I got a picture of this uh, crape myrtle uh, plant, and when I saw this, I was like, "What? Did somebody uh, painted black paint on this?" And the email that I got back was that definitely no, not black paint. The spots are very hard. Dark areas have no bark. Also, these are uh, only on one tree, adjacent trees have no spots. So in case we don't know what these are, uh, if you know what this is, great. Uh, in case we don't know, uh, what questions do you think we should be uh, asking? Have you all seen this? I have not. <laughs> I, have, I have now. Yeah. <laughs> nope. I, I remember, remember there's one time another crepe myrtle tree and we thought that one was, uh, you know, was it uh, uh, a deer? Remember, was was it deer damage? Was it hog damage? Was it something? Right. It turned out it was, uh, it was a three-year-old or five-year-old, you, know, uh, 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 you know, practicing with uh, his knife. <laughs> that one, remember that one. So this one, I, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, this is the first time I ever seen this, this black paint, hard paint. Um, I'm going to say 24D. <laughs> <laughs> Airbound 24D is not going to be uh, <laughs> the cover <-all. laughs> Are there any other symptoms? Are they seeing any other symptoms on the tree? Like, are the leaves okay? Is it still bloom? Looks like sharp. Um, I don't <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's not paint. Maybe it's a black sharpie. That's a that good thing. Like <laughs> We're gonna have a Dalmatian tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this time I, I should probably ask. You know, do you have any kids? How old are they? <laughs> How mischievous. <laughs> you know, maybe they're just running out of things for their kids to do during during this uh, pandemic. So. <laughs> I would really, yeah, I would really like to hear from the uh, from the audience, N not hear from you. If you could type something, you know, uh, what do you guys think? You know, this is very uh, this is very interesting. I mean, very interesting. Uh, so there's a lot of like lichens on the tree. Could it be something like that? Yeah, well, if you look at this, you know, this black thing is also covering this. Uh, is also covering this. Uh, lichens you know partially here and you know like and also here it's i would again i i i'm i'm thinking this could very like be two legged uh culprit instead of four legs or six legs um or no legs oh. <laughs> right or no legs I guess a question would be is if you rub your finger on it, does anything come off? You know, does okay. it does the black come off like okay. spores? Okay. Or is it just, you know, like you said, did someone just have nothing to better to do with a Sharpie and uh fill in the spots? <laughs> All right, mystery unsolved. And uh, we're gonna do uh, <laughs> mystery unsolved and we're gonna do a little bit more uh investigation. So uh the real taste for what it's like to be an extension. Yes. You know that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, you tell me. <laughs> Melinda offers that this could be, you know, the pruning paint by the maintenance person. And, and I think that could very uh, well be. Yeah, I think that could be very but could be the they case. Said definitely not like paint. Yeah. Well, I get a question. Is that tree still alive? Yeah, yeah, the tree is still alive. And the person just sent me some, uh, uh, just emailed me, you know, the quote that I put in there. 
and uh, and I'm about to call that person uh, to figure out more. So I'm asking you guys, you know, what question I should be asking. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so. give give you a few thoughts here. So it's really hard to see here. You know, get a three dimensional feel. Mm -hmm. You wonder if the the bark have flaked off, and 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 what you see there are cankers, and underneath the dark area is actually wood, or is it like a limpet that's on there? So. I think was it Paul that mentioned if if you know the ass is is it a stroma? So if they say it's hard, mm -hmm. is it like a pancake hard thing that you can flake off? <laughs> if it is and it takes some bark with it, mm -hmm. it may be a fungal fungal agent of some sort. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I've seen this happen before is uh, something that we artificially do as uh, some work wood workers would would do. To get wood stain, you know, we would put dye in there for the root to take up, and 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 so we get actually the xylem that is stained. So again, a core sample there will give you an idea about how deep uh, uh, that black area is. So so the hard part here with picture is you don't have that three dimensional that depth perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you're right. And and again, you know, um, related to my question about you know, do you have kids? How old are they? And Robbie said, uh, uh, you know, maybe, you know, do the black spots go all the way up the tree or stop where a human might reach, you know? <laughs> so I'm going to, well, I'm going to add a question, not only how old the kid is, but yeah, how tall how the tall? kid is, how tall. Yeah, the, you know, air fun tall. Air fun tall or <laughs> air fun tall or mung mung tall. So there's, uh, there's a, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say one thing as far as, you know, pruning paint job and all that. If it's a paint job, it's not recent because that is too clean, too nice edging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that's one thing that 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 you'll you'll realize from that. The other reason I ask why you know whether the plant is still alive or not, you see not only a lot of lichens, but you also see a lot of wood deterioration uh, towards the base. Oh, here. Yeah. So you need to be able to ask a question. You know, mm -hmm. does it look? Alive? Does it look good or does it look crappy? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you all so much for your uh, inputs. Uh, I would uh, definitely uh, put all these things uh, uh, in the uh, you know when I ask the question. Uh, and of course, you know another thank you, William. Uh, or maybe you go by Bill, like a Becky. You know, Rebecca. She goes by Becky. <laughs> This is something me as a Chinese I can't comprehend. Uh, Bill, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, you know, any other plants, just just like the previous cray myrtle, uh, you know, any other plants, uh, you know, exhibiting the uh, the symptoms. So, uh, so I appreciate all your uh, uh, input on this. And this concludes our chat today. And thank you all. <laughs>